Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next EDW session called A Case Study, Standing Up a Data Governance Program and Data Capabilities During a Global Pandemic, which will be presented by Jenny Schultz, the Data Governance Director at KPMG US, and Karam Mahmoud, the Director of Digital Management at KPMG US as well. All audience members are needed during these sessions, so please submit your questions in the Q&A window on the right-hand side of the screen. And our speakers will respond to as many questions as possible at the end of the talk. Please note that there is a linked form at the bottom of the page titled EDW Conference Session Survey. This is where you can submit session feedback, and we encourage you to do so. So now let's begin our presentation. Thank you, and welcome, Jenny and Karam. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, good morning from Arlington, Virginia, where it is in the mid 60s and full of pollen in the air. Uh, my name is Jenny Schultz. Uh, you heard I'm the director of data governance at KPMG. Uh, I started there a year ago, or started here a year ago during at the height of the global pandemic. And I'm joined by Karam. Karam, you want to say a little more about yourself? Yeah, hello everyone. Good morning, also from Virginia. Um, I've been with KPMG about two years now. Um, I'm a director in our data services practice, as any of our peers, and we're happy to take you through our case study today. Thank you. So welcome. Thanks for joining. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about uh, our data journey, how we began, uh, kind of what we've done to stand up our data governance program, and then I'll turn it over to Karam to talk about uh, the data capabilities that are needed to support uh, our data program here at KPMG. And then of course, we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So what is KPMG? We are a group of global firms uh, that provide tax, audit, and advisory services to many types of clients. Uh, we, Karam and I are focused on the United States uh, member firm, and it is uh, large. Uh, we have, there's over 30,000 people, and as you can imagine, lots of data. So where did we start our data journey? It started back in 2018, where we spent uh, quite a bit, uh, quite a bit amount of time interviewing dozens of stakeholders to understand what were their challenges with data. Where were they, um, where were we falling short uh, in either taking too long to, to meet a client deliverable and maybe we could have done something better or just how do we work better internally to the firm? And this slide is the output of what we learned from all those stakeholder interviews. So why do we need a program, a data program at KPMG? Well, it's growth, right? We wanna be able to increase speed to market, uh, we've got, we want to beat our competitors, uh, you know, get more clients and also potentially provide additional services to our existing clients, right? We want to grow and expand uh, our services and products. And let's talk about, you know, reducing costs. You know, how can we automate all of the data that we have here at KPMG? Um, KPMG has been around over a hundred years and many in a few different forms, but in total over a hundred years. Uh, and you can imagine that our technology journey started earlier and we've been collecting lots of data for, for decades. And, you know, way before the terms data governance uh, and data capabilities and all these, all these wonderful terms that you all uh, are embedded in. And, we needed a way to you know, automate some of those cleansing and standardizing activities uh, so that we could spend the time actually providing insights to either our clients or to help us make better decisions internally. And we also wanted to increase the transparency of the data we have and you know, make sure that folks can get what they need when they need it to do their jobs, right? Enhancing that self-service. And lastly, risk management, right? We don't want to under control our data or over control our data, right? So how do we master our data so that we have good data quality here at the firm? You know, our data is organized. We know what needs to be retained. Um, as you can imagine, you know, we're here not only to provide value through our data, right? And think about data as an asset, but also about 
you know, again, managing risk. It's kind of that that defensive position. We are a highly regulated firm and we have a lot of external bodies that we need to meet their needs. Uh, so we want to make sure, again, that our data quality is fit for use and that we are only exposing the data to those who need to know. So this, this is what we heard from our stakeholders in 2018. And that led to the creation of the department that Karam and I are in. It's called Data Strategy and Operations. And it led to, you know, the hiring of a chief data officer, you know, determining, you know, what did we need to do to help solve these problems and meet the needs of our stakeholders? So this is a view of our data strategy and at a glance here on one slide, and I'm going to start from the bottom up. So again, I talked about our group as data strategy and operations, uh, and we are here to you know, implement the data strategy, um, build a data supply chain from source to act, you know, source to target or consumption and everything in between that needs to happen, right? Governance, processes, tools, uh, technologies, uh, and that you can see kind of in the middle here, all the things we're working on to help, again, help our stakeholders meet their needs. We've got uh, a literacy program. How do we make sure that we all talk the same language? Uh, data governance, which is my bread and butter, right? Making sure that we are treating data as an asset and doing all those wonderful things like, you know, checking for quality and, and metadata um, and confidentiality rules. Again, I, you heard me say um, we're a highly regulated industry in a highly regulated industry. How do we make sure that uh, we are protecting the data we have? We have a lot of data about our clients and we're making sure that we're complying with all the regulations, laws and regulations out there about our data. Uh, data quality accelerators, right? How do we uh, enhance the completeness and accuracy of our data? Again, making sure that our quality is fit for purpose. Uh, creating a metadata source of truth. So again, tools, technologies, and processes around enhancing the transparency of our data, mastering our data. Uh, again, we have a lot of data and I'm, it's all over. So how do we make sure that there's one golden record uh, so that folks know where to get the best data from? Uh, we buy a lot of data at KPMG, so we have a group dedicated to making sure that we comply with those vendor contracts and use that data the way it should be. And then we have a group also focused on building those things that we need at the center, right? So an enterprise data warehouse, uh, a data lake to, again, provide that one-stop shop for those who need uh, the data. And you can see here, uh, moving up from that, you know, the data supply chain, again, from sourcing, you know, to storing that data, using it for advanced insights and analytics, and then consuming and reporting off that data. That data. So our goal is to, you know, make this kind of a seamless data supply chain uh, that's, you know, standardized, consistent, uh, and as efficient as possible, again, so that folks can get the data they need to generate those insights for themselves or for and again, you already heard me talk about why we're doing this, right? Increase speed to market, we wanna protect the firm, uh, decrease costs and make sure that we're managing our risks appropriately. So I view uh, a data program or a data governance program as kind of a culture change initiative, right? This is, yes, somewhat of a data problem, but it's really about culture change. How do we get the firm thinking about data differently. And so we've done this through a couple of ways here. We have uh, training that we deliver, again, to teach everybody, like, what is data governance and management? What are the best practices in the industry? What do they mean? We might be doing them here, but we might call them something different. How do we get everybody speaking the same language and understanding what these principles are? How do we know who our supporters are, who our detractors are? right? Understanding who our stakeholders are. Again, you know, I said I started a year ago. I have met with everyone and anyone who would accept my meeting invite. And just like this, right? Through a computer, on a laptop, with video, uh, you know, just understanding who they are, what their needs are. Are they going to be able to, are they going to work with us and help us, you know, um, 
change the culture of the firm around data or are they going to be the well i've always done it this way person right so really want to focus on um, those early adopters who will work with us uh, to you know again get these get these things promulgated throughout the firm so we have targeted communications that go out we started a newsletter uh, again we are so large so we have to get creative about how we communicate with folks you know one-on-one -on -one meetings are the best um, but you know, I can't uh, I can't meet with 30,000 people one on one on a monthly basis. So we have we, we've gotten creative. Presence as well. Uh, and we have working groups and a data council, which I'll talk about on the next slide. But it's really about, you know, collaborating as much as we can, understanding what folks need how can we help them and making sure that the things that we do and accomplish for the firm there we can map them to their business priorities and show them hey we've got this new thing this new data capability or new tool implemented and here's how it can help you uh, and then you know measuring progress showing progress making sure we're transparent at every single stage of everything we're doing goes a long way right it builds it builds adoption and we've also been working with folks you know to be their arms and legs right so some of these data concepts are new uh, to the firm and so we are educating them uh, again through large things like training large efforts like training but also uh, in a more kind of intimate setting like talking to them about their area their data asset you know, let's talk through you know, what it means to adopt these data governance and management principles for your area. And here is a, a view of kind of who we work with in the data governance space. So I mentioned a data council. We set up a data council, again, with leaders across the firm. So we've, we've got, you know, profit centers, right, in our advisory tax and audit businesses. And then we also have groups like finance and HR. And so we have a group uh, that gets together monthly to talk about uh, where is the data strategy, you know, how are we doing, you know, where do we need to focus next. Um, our, our current effort right now, we just did a, a data capability assessment. So we're working on getting those results together and then we're going to be showing them to the data council and saying, okay, help us make a decision about where you want to focus, right? Resources are not uh, not unlimited. Uh, so we've got to prioritize, like, what can we work on that can provide the biggest bang for the buck at the firm? And then we also have a data governance working group. We meet every other week, and that is, I would say, kind of more boots on the ground. Uh, and they are uh, the same, kind of in the same areas as the data council members, but are, are, we use them for more of an oper from an operational perspective. Like, how can we implement these things in the firm? And, you know, they'll be the ones doing them, right? But they also make recommendations to the data council on decisions that need to be made. And we have a federated data governance model. So again, we are large and uh, my team talks about the what, right? What are the rules of the road about data for the firm? And the federated data officers who are most likely uh, some of the same folks in the data council are there to say okay here's how we're going to implement this thing in our function and here's how it'll be most meaningful to our people because every business line is different everyone kind of has a different mindset uh, in this area all right kpmg and then you know the data owners the data leads data stewards data consumers uh, they're you know, we are identifying them, you know, fast and feverishly and, you know, educating them on who they are and what their roles and responsibilities are. But again, I consider them, they are really helping us, again, adopt and execute what needs to get done to um, implement these, these data governance and management best, best practices. And you'll see over on the top right, we've got some we have some uh, little icons about how we work together now that we are in a global pandemic. And, you know, we do have a lot of meetings with folks, but we've been trying to condense meeting times, you know, give people a break, you know, time to step away and get a glass of water in between meetings. So we're, we're doing uh, our part to make sure that it's not, you're not, you know, virtually running from meeting to meeting to meeting. 
And the data governance standard. So how did we develop and publish a data governance standard? I could have gone in a room, you know, put a bunch of words uh, in, in you know, Microsoft Word and said, okay, here are the rules of the road around data. And I, I could have said, you know, put a gavel down and said, here, have a nice day. Here are the rules. We didn't do that. We took um, kind of a, again, a shell of what good data governance industry standard, data governance and management uh, best practices are, put them on a piece of paper, and then we went through them with the data governance working group word by word, line by line. Yes, it was tedious, but we heard the concerns, the questions of the group. They felt bought in because they helped create this document with us. And then that document was also reviewed and ratified by the data council as well. And it took you know a fair amount of time, uh, at least six months, if not longer, right, to go through this process. And because there was some education that had to get, had to come with this process, right? Like why do we need a section that talks about metadata in this document? And so we had a lot of, okay, well, what is this gonna mean to me? How's this gonna work? So a lot of, you know, a lot of whiteboarding sessions about what this document should say, you know, how it should say it. Uh, and uh, so it's, again, my, what's worked well is creating things with this group. And then we did the same thing with the training, right? So once we got the data governance standard with those, again, industry, you know, guiding principles together, we created a training deck and we piloted it with those data governance working group members, right? Ask them for feedback. Tell us what you need, you know, you need to understand more of so that we make sure we meet your needs. Um, and so now we're, we're training on a quarterly basis and, you know, getting the word out about kind of the basics uh, of, of data governance and management. All right, now I'm going to turn it over to Karam, who is going to talk to you uh, in more detail about, okay, so I've talked to you about our data journey, our data governance program, how we've stood it up, who, who our stakeholders are, how we work together. Uh, and Karam will tell you about the supporting tools and technologies that help make this, again, a robust data program. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you, Jenny. Um, <clears throat> so as Jenny talked about the overarching data governance uh, structure that we have put around, um, what we also wanted to do from the center, right, again, coming from the CDO office, we wanted to set up some enterprise data services that we can provide as a foundational capability to our stakeholders. And again, our stakeholders are different uh, functions of KPMG, right? So as Jenny spoke about our functions such as audit tax um, and advisory. So, so I'll go around uh, the, the slide. We have four services that we wanna to talk to you about today uh, that we'll zoom in on in, in the next uh, you know, 20 minutes or so. So I'll start on the far right top, right? So metadata management is at the heart and the foundation of everything, right? So <clears throat> once we have identified the data owners, um, and a lot of the roles that Jenny talked about, we wanna make sure that we understand the business context of the data, right? And this is where we define the business context of the data, as well as the technical context, right? So we, we, we get the business context and we tie it to the technical information to get a full picture of where our data resides and what does it mean, right? And that's why the value that we're adding to the, uh, to the to, to our stakeholders is that we're making our, um, stakeholders and our professionals in the field, we're making them data intelligent, right? We're making, giving them more awareness of where the data is. And also other features that we provide are that, you know, they're, they're able to get their hands on the data. We provide a provisioning service as well, where they can get their hands on the data from the metadata management tool. If you come over to the left side on the top, data quality, which is a natural next step after gathering metadata. So once you have identified your critical data elements, we wanna make sure we're able to measure and monitor the quality of data in our firm, right? And a lot of the data that we deal with is internal data, business operations data, but it's also our client data that we ingest into the four walls of KPMG. And we wanna make sure that it's protected and the quality upon transfer is correct. Um, so the value we provide here to the firm is the data health, and also the exception monitoring, the root cause analysis, the remediation of the data issues. 
So that's in essence data quality and we'll zoom into each one of these in a second. If you move over to the right side bottom, we're talking about master data management here. So Jenny hit upon that a little bit, right? So if you have disparate sources across the firm about some of your master data, right? So your client entities, your contacts, your employee data, your vendor data, these are all master data sets that should not have multiple versions of the truth. So master data management attempts to combine this data to create golden records and becomes a single provisioning source for the firm. So we have done that and we have provided customer 360 views to the rest of the firm. And if you come to the left side, last but not the least is policy engine, what we're calling a policy engine, but essentially what it is is data privacy and protection. So if you, if you collected the metadata, you measuring data quality and health, you're creating single version of the truth from a golden records perspective, then the last part is that you wanna protect your data. So if our professionals are trying to use the data for whatever purpose, right? It could be their client engagements, it could be a research assignment. Uh, we wanna make sure that they use the data according to the policies that govern the data. So as you know, KPMG is a large firm. We have client contracts, we have vendor contracts, we have our own risk policies, our CISO policies, and we have laws and regulations that we have to abide by. All of those are um, can be very cumbersome for a person who wants to just use the data. So what Policy Engine does is that it provides the transparency of what the data governing rules are and how can you get your hands on the data while staying inbound with the rules. So I've given you an overview of the four services. What I'd like to do now is zoom into each one of them and kind of talk about how we progress them through the pandemic. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so the first service we're gonna talk about is the master data management. As you know, the biggest, um, I would say, um, foundation of a successful master data management program is building trust with your stakeholders. Because essentially what you're doing is you're going to different stakeholders and you're saying, well, you know what, instead of you maintaining data in your world, I'm going to centralize the data and you're gonna to come to this centralized spot to maintain the data. And as you can imagine in a global pandemic, it was very hard to have those face-to-face -face conversations where you can build the trust, right? And, and, and you know, not all the time we have our cameras on. I mean, I give kudos to Jenny. She has a cameras on 99% of the time, right? But not everyone has their cameras on all the time, right? Um, but the way uh, we um, build this trust during the pandemic is that we had to do, I mean, myself, I had to personally do a lot of, I would say, pre-meets and post-meets, right? So, so you can imagine a lot of those hallway conversations before you go into a meeting room, right? Or after you come out of the meeting room, you debrief for like two, three minutes, right? Um, so those actually turn into, and Jenny talked about condensed meetings, right? Those turn into five minute, 10 minute meeting calendar invites on the calendar. <clears throat> So, so that's how we pivoted to building trust um, with our stakeholders as we wanted to bring them on board with the master data management solution. Um, and and if, I, if I were to just talk a little bit about the, what we have on this slide in the middle, um, I mean, you guys all probably heard people process technology. So, so again, no brainer here. It, it's built on people process technology uh, as well as data domains. So, so uh, we made sure that we did not start off with systems or applications, right? We started off with domains. So we wanna fix our customer data. We wanna fix our contacts data or entity data, right? Um, so that's where we started. And, um, you know, we, we, uh, we interviewed folks. We talked about who are all the people involved? What are the current technologies? What are the current processes? And, and the way we turned that <clears throat> into a value was that, well, a lot of the inefficient processes will go away, right? A lot of the uh, folks who are doing non-value added work, they can now do value added work, right? Which is post, uh, I would say match merge, which is the deduplication process of MDM. So we were able to um, convey this value to our stakeholders um, in the pandemic, um, you know, doing those pre and post meetings, um, having a lot of virtual sessions, uh, and we were able to deliver value. Um, and um, something I didn't note earlier, um, around all these data services, we're heavily uh, Informatica slash Calibra a shop here. 
Uh, so we're using Informatica solution for our MDM um, solution here. Um, and it's working great for us. And, and the other point I want to mention is, is that um, we're maturing, right? So, so we are in our year, I would say, two of our foundational capability. And now we're maturing to some of the next steps, uh, right? So we're introducing new technologies. All right. So we'll move, we'll move on to the next service. Uh, so the next service is data quality. So uh, again, what is data quality? We touched upon this already, but if you look at the slide here, we wanna make sure that we put data quality in a fit for purpose model, right? Uh, so what you're looking at is our framework, uh, which says that, you know what, in any data supply chain from acquisition all the way to storage, all the way to consumption, we wanna make sure that we hit five types of data quality controls, which you see at the bottom here, right? Data capture, data entry rules, um, data at rest rules, data movement rules, data reconciliation rules, and an, and an, an, an anomaly detection, right? Uh, and the reason I mentioned fit for purpose is that because that became very crucial for us when we were implementing data quality one by one across the firm, right? Because we wanted to make sure that the riskier data, right, or data that you know has a lot of consumers, right, or that has already identified issues got heavy data quality versus something, you know, which uh, wasn't hitting any crucial reporting, right? Or, you know, the data wasn't uh, uh, that large or didn't have too many data quality process or existing processes on it. So that helped us implement data quality in a, in a wide area of uh, systems and applications rather than zooming in on one system application. The other point I'd like to mention here is that um, standardization, is very important, right? So you see on the left bottom side that we have BQ dimensions. So we at KPMG, our data strategy, we have aligned ourselves with the EDM council. Now, if you go outside in the industry, there may be about three, four, five data quality frameworks or dimensions out there. And at the end of the day, most of them say one or the same thing, right? But you have to, the point is that you have to pin yourself to one of the frameworks and dimensions uh, and go consistent at it. So we have picked EDM Council, which is pretty comprehensive and we're happy with it. And those are the dim dimensions that we cover when we implement data quality. Uh, again, so how did we pivot to the pandemic while implementing data quality in our environment? So I would say, of course, the pre-meets and post-meets were important here as well. Uh, but in data quality, what became more important for us was virtual sessions uh, because there are a lot of demoing abilities here, right? Because data quality, um, the way you develop the rules and the way you come out with the data quality scorecards and the dashboards, a lot of visualizations involved. Um, so here, the way we pivoted was that we had a lot of virtual sessions, a lot of demos. Uh, we memorized our um, demos and spiel by the end of the day, right? But we were doing a lot of road shows, um, a lot of some one-on-one -on -one demos, right? Uh, some large demos, and that was very um, helpful uh, to get the uh, capability understood out there. I think we can move on to the uh, next uh, uh, service here. All right, so the next service is the metadata marketplace. So um, we have coined the term internally, we call it metadata marketplace, but essentially this is the metadata management solution we talked about uh, in the original slide. Uh, and like I said, this is the foundation of all the services, right? So um, we have a metadata management solution. Uh, it, it's built on Calibra um, and um, <clears throat> it, it provides the business context uh, for the data, right? So we're able to uh, define uh, data sets, logical containers. We're able to define business elements, the enterprise definitions. We're able to identify high level classifications of data. We're able to identify uh, critical data elements versus non-critical data elements. So all that um, is done in the metadata marketplace, um, which becomes the foundation of then implementing data quality or master data or policy engine that we'll talk about in a second. Um, again, this is again one of those tools that required uh, visualization, right? Because this is a self-service uh, tool that's available uh, to our entire uh, KPMG US practice. Um, so we did a lot of virtual sessions here. We did a lot of demos. 
Uh, and something creative that we did is that we recorded um, short videos, right? How-to videos. Um, you know, how do you filter? How do you navigate? How do you search, right? Uh, and then we put those short videos um, on our uh, metadata marketplace, uh, you know, training videos page. So that helped alleviate a lot of the uh, one-off questions that that we would get. Um, and the last one I'll make on this is that um, you know we've also provisioned this tool um, to request access to the data. So again, some of the data can be accessed, or at least the uh, request form can be initiated uh, from our Metadata Marketplace tool. I'm getting some questions here on the left. Um, <clears throat> so 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 let me cover this last slide, and I think what we'll do is. We'll tackle the questions uh, uh, towards the end because we have to, about 10 to 15 minutes at the end. So, so the last uh, service I'd like to talk about is a policy engine. Uh, again, the internal term that we have coined for the solution is policy engine, but in essence what it is is a, is a data privacy and protection solution. Um, so, so as I talked about, right, that data can be governed through uh, our contracts that we have with the owners of the data, right? It could be vendor, it could be clients. Um, it could be our internal risk policy, our CISO policies, our risk framework, right? Um, or it could be laws and regulations. It could be uh, GDPR, CCPA, um, or our favorite these days, Tax 7216 law. Um, so so what, we have, what we have done in this policy engine solution is that we have brought all those uh, different um, policies, if you will, and we have centralized them in a very easy to read and easy to process rules. Um, so, you know, uh, the rules around data access, rules around data usage, rules around data storage, right? That contractors cannot access this data, or, you know, you cannot take this data offshore, right? To, to your offshore team. You cannot use this data beyond the original engagement team or something. Um, so what we have done is that we have centralized the rules and um, we have then, um, applied the solution to different applications at KPMG. And what we're able to do is we're able to classify and tag our data with easy policy rules. So our professionals, before they get their hands on the data, they can see, can I share this data with my offshore team? Can I use this for in my data lake for secondary analysis, right? Um, so that has helped tremendously um, our professionals in um, provisioning the data. Um, and also uh, where they store the data. So another uh, use case for this is that when we store our data, uh, we have different environments, you know, highly secured, uh, medium or less secure. So we're able to use these policy rules to inform our application owners uh, in which area of the application they should store the data. So that has helped us a lot. And again, Policy Engine, I would say, is one of a very unique solutions that we had to actually stitch together multiple industry products from Informatica um, and build a solution that works for us. And uh, we are in our year one of this journey and we're gonna continue um, to um, you know, elaborate on this. The point I'll make on this solution from a um, um, pandemic pivot perspective is that um, since this was a large uh, solution uh, which required a very large cross function, cross-discipline a team, we had some turnover, right? And so I don't know um, from folks uh, on the session today who experienced this, but COVID was, um, we experienced some turnover because people were moving locations, uh, folks were more fluid uh, in their destinations. Uh, and so one point I have there at the top is getting personal, right? So in order to um, keep the team engaged, keep the morale high. While, of course, we did that, a lot of that at the top, uh, you know, from our uh, CDO and everything, uh, we made sure that we spent time in the beginning and end of our meetings uh, to get to know people, right? Uh, we had a lot of new folks joining the team, joining the firm directly on the project. Um, so we got personal with everyone uh, on Zoom, right, on Teams. Uh, we were asking family questions, you know, house project questions, right, health questions. Uh, so a lot of that helped us retain I would say talent and and keep up the morale on some of these large projects. 
I think, Jenny, we have one last slide where we summarize uh, our um, pandemic strategy. So um, I, I, my throat is dry, so I'll, I'll turn it over to you. To <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I mean, just to echo kind of, you, you've heard Karan, like working, you know, 100% uh, virtually has its challenges. And when you're standing up a new program, it's even more difficult to build relationships with stakeholders. You know, to Karam's point, not everyone is on video. You can't, you know, you can't interpret their nonverbals. Um, so I, I try to, to be on video as much as possible in hopes that others will will do it too. So I can get to, to again, see their face and know like, are they scowling? Are they smiling? Um, and, but again, you know, Karam and I, we spent a ton of time, you know, having those virtual coffee chats with our stakeholders, our teams, uh, our peers, our leaders. I mean, just up, down, sideways, as many as we could. Again, to get to know people, get personal, you know, because work and life has just become kind of, you know, one big blended activity now, right? I, who, who does laundry while they're on the phone, right? Or folds clothes. It's just part of kind of our daily life now. Um, and again, and, and working, you know, working virtually, having those meetings with our stakeholders to help, you know, solution things together has been really important, right? Let's brainstorm, let's figure this out together, right? Having that mindset and not just kind of dictating things to people has been helpful. And again, you already heard me talk about condensing meeting times. You know, do you really need 30 minutes for that touch point or could you have a 15 minute? Do you really need an hour or is this something you could cover in 45, right? So I'm constantly challenging myself and my team to think about, okay, yes, we need to be more intentional about uh, communicating with each other, but can we reduce the amount of time? Because people are, you know, there's just meeting fatigue, right? And staring at a screen all day, you know, by the end of the day, I'm sure you're tired, like I'm tired. So how do we, um, how do we, you know, get the job done, but think about others at the same time? And, you know, and Karam talked about, you know, building trust, you know, do what you're going to say or say what, you know, do what you say you're going to do, right? Help build that trust, you know, community, you know, follow through on, on anything that you've promised, you know, again, you know, meet the people, really understand your stakeholders needs, ask questions, right? And, you know, having, having those, those coffee chats, and sometimes there were happy hours too, there still are, um, having those one-on-one -on -one talks, you know, sometimes people don't feel comfortable in larger meetings, you know, bringing things up, they're more introverted, or they want to, take something away and think about it. Um, and again, you know, it, it really does help, you know, smile, turn on your camera. I know you're not always camera ready. I'm not always camera ready, but when I am, uh, I try to do this as much as I can. So we call these our, our pandemic pivots and they have really helped us again, you know, build relationships, get things done, uh, enhance trust uh, and and move our data strategy forward. So with that, uh, I will open it up for our question part of our session. Thank you both so much. We've got a lot of great questions coming in. We'll get to as many as possible here in the time left. So I'm just going to dive in. Um, thank you for the helpful presentation. Our data governance program was launched this last January, just four months ago. You spoke about training programs. Do you have an, uh, or can you send us some information about your training programs? Yeah, I'll have to see, I'll have to check in to see what I'm allowed to share and what I'm not allowed to share. Uh, but yes, we've, you know, we took our data governance standard and said, okay, what are the main topic areas? Quality, metadata, you know, went through all, you know, classification, went through all those things and just really, you know, tried to break it down for people. What is, again, and, and by role too, like what does a data owner do? What does a data, uh, what does a data steward do? So yeah, it's, um, let me check in and see if I'm allowed to share or what I'm allowed to share. I love it. And may I recommend people connect with you in the Spot Me app to follow up on that? Is that okay? Sounds good. Awesome. I love it. So how do you provide KPIs on data governance to provide business justification for budgeting and project planning? <laughs> this is always a tough one. 
Oh, it's it's always a work in progress, right? Um, especially when you're in build mode, right? Which is where we still are from my perspective. So um, what we did with our data council, uh, every we run on a fiscal year, right? So September to September. And what we do at the beginning of every fiscal year is say, okay, data council, here are the things that we think we should work on, right? We create kind of a, a view into a roadmap. And we say, okay, do you think this? these are the things that will help you the most, right? Move your function forward or, or help you, you know, with an enterprise service, whatever it is. And we get their buy-in before we even start working on things. Because there's no point in us delivering something that no one's going to use or care about. And then we track progress to the items on those roadmaps. Um, governance has, has, again, it's difficult to show value quantitatively, but eventually once you are kind of past that build mode, you can show, hey, there are so many critical data elements identified and so many that have controls on them, uh, or we have, you know, metadata and lineage on them. So there that it's more kind of, I would say it's easier to do kind of after that build phase during build, which is where we are. It's what's the status, what's the progress of this initiative? Are you green, yellow, red, you know, 90% complete, whatever it is. Awesome. Thank you. So have you dealt with archive data, particularly the metadata and decision to load data up to which year? Oh gosh, because I mentioned how old we are. That's <laughs> so. Um, so it is a we're taking a risk based approach. So we are not loading every single piece of data and governing every single piece of data. Right? We are starting with what data is critical to the firm, uh, and that is you know a conversation with our data governance working group members, our data council members. You know which which data assets are you leveraging for kind of your most important uses? And that's where we're starting, right? There's no way we will ever, uh, you know, ingest and govern every single piece of data. So that's how we tackle it. And how do you handle the debate on data privacy? Any experience with that? So can you say more about the debate? Which debate? I feel like there are a lot of debates. <laughs> Well, what's the most common debate you've had? Um, it's always the balance of, you know, you heard Karam say, you know, there are lots of rules, lots of laws, lots of regulations. How do you balance making sure that we are complying with those while also, you know, trying to generate as much value as you can out of the data? So there's, there's, it's usually case by case basis. And that's why Karam and team are working hard on that policy engine so that we can create a framework so that it's not always a case by case basis. We don't have to come to the well every single time users and say, do we need, can we use this data for this purpose? It's like, no, let's create a, let's create a, a standard set of rules as much as we can and say, okay, you know, can you use this data for this purpose? Yes or no, or yes with some stipulations. And Carl, I'm just assuming that you're you're letting Jenny in, so I don't want to be cutting you off. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to say, Carl, no, no, please chime in. We have tons of questions, and I got a lot of juicy ones after that as well. So yeah, I, I agree with what Jenny said. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, not knowing exactly what debate we're talking about, I, I'm good with us answer. Yeah. All right. So then, uh, do you adopt tools prior to start of your uh, journey, or in the middle of the way? Um, I, I can take this one. So, um, so, so again, strategically, not right in the beginning, right? So, so we always start with some sort of a data strategy around our services, right? So whether it was MDM or uh, metadata marketplace or data quality, we always start with a data strategy that tells us, defines what the service is, what the problem statement is, what the solution is, which is tool agnostic. Um, and then, so, so, and then we do a vendor landscape. Uh, we do a product evaluation. So we have pretty rigid, uh, I would say, processes. And, and even sometimes, if we know uh, of some of the, you know, A1 marketplace leaders, uh, we still like to uh, prove out some of these um, uh, evaluations, right? Uh, because again, we are a very regulated, heavily regulated firm, um, and uh, we always want to make sure that we have the strategy. 
and the evaluations documented uh, before we jump into any tools, right? So, so we do our homework basically. So we don't decide tools uh, right in the beginning um, as part of our strategy. I love it. And have you guys done some uh, work yourselves to showcase the significance of true and trusted data? Um, I'm guessing if this is related to maybe um, MDM, uh, yeah. So uh, again, the part of our data strategy is some level of data profiling and showing the impact and the extent of the problem, right? As I talked about MDM, there's a huge component of buy-in and trust. And uh, what, what we have done in the beginning or what we had done in the beginning was that we picked a few problem areas um, and we actually profiled the data uh, we actually pinpointed where the issues were, and and then we uh, and then we showcase right. Uh, if you clean this data or dedupe it, what are some of the advantages, right? Um, so yeah, we, we did do a lot of the work uh, ourselves, and, and even once we deploy these services, right? Uh, I don't know if the question is geared towards that, but we are involved, right? So uh, my team does a lot of the. Um, initial false positive uh, reviews, uh, whether it's data quality or MDM. We facilitate with the data owners and the data stewards uh, in diving in the data, right? And approving deduplication results or root cause analysis, all of that. Right, and you know, just jump in any, to any of these questions. I don't want to cut anybody off, so just let me know, say so from question to question. Um, what tool did you say you use for metadata? Calibra, Calibra, yes. Okay. And did you think KPMG has entered the era of AI and machine learning? Um, I can start with that, Jenny, if you want. Um, so, so as we said, uh, we are, I would say, two years now um, into our uh, data strategy, right? The Chief Data Officer data strategy. So now we're getting to a point where um, we're embarking on those, right? So we always had that vision in our data strategy. Um, for AI and machine learning. So the tools that we procured, um, the architectures that we set up, we set up with that in mind that that was coming, right? And, and now that we are at a point where we have deployed some of the, uh, I would say, foundational capabilities, now we're maturing our services with a lot of the algorithms and a lot of models that help us either in data quality, right? Helping us, uh, nudging us towards some data quality rules that we have, may have missed, or some match merge algorithms or rules that we may have missed from a match merge MDM perspective. Um, so we're definitely embarking on that now that we have deployed the basic foundational capabilities. All right, uh, it's, we have time for just a few more questions here, so I'll sneak in as many as I can. Uh, is KPMG now using cloud computing? Um, KPMG is a hybrid multi-cloud strategy firm. So yes, um, we have a lot of solutions that are uh, on the cloud, a lot of lakes on the cloud. Um, so we have a solution, um, but, but the way we're set up because of our client base, uh, you know, we will always have need for some on-prem data. Um, so that's why our solutions are hybrid. So we're able to support uh, a lot of the cloud platforms multi-cloud as well as on-prem solutions. So yeah, we are set up for that. So in regards to the policy engine, uh, is the policy from the engine automatically applied or is it up to the user to actually follow the policy? For example, is it just a reference or does it enforce the rules? Yeah. Do you have a sneak preview or example yeah. you could share? A good, great question. So um, it's actually both. So we, we have the ability to, um, for a data owner to fill out a survey um, and uh, manually classify the data. So, so I would say semi-automatic where uh, we need some input from the data owner in terms of um, what they know about the data, um, but the policy rules are already ingested in our library, right? Um, so based on that survey, we can automatically uh, hit the survey against the policy rules and the logic we have, and then it automatically applies the policy rules with the data set. So, so again, we're applying it to the metadata, right? So we're applying it at the data set level uh, and sometimes at the data attribute level. Um, and, and we're also building a capability where, uh, you know, multiple applications can do an automated, automated service call to the policy engine. So again, we, this is a centralized 
utility that's set up as a service for other KPMG applications where they can call on the policy engine and, um, and classify their data. Uh, the manual part is a little bit of the policy rules. They have to be uh, uh, hydrated in our library, uh, but there are some automation, some manual steps there. All right. Well, that just is bringing us to the end of our session. Thank you, Jenny and Karam, for that wonderful Thank presentation. You. We just want to know again that there is a linked form at the bottom of the page called EDW Conference Session Survey. This is where you can submit feedback for today's session. That wraps this up to this wrap that, excuse me, I can talk now. <laughs> that wraps up the session. You are welcome to continue networking with each other and within the SpotMe app as we take a quick break between sessions. We look forward to seeing you then. Again, Jenny and Karam, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.